Welcome everyone to our weekly HDI Local Chapters live stream show. All right, so today's show is brought to you by Robert Half Technologies. They help companies build, deploy, and operate technology in this digital world. And they do that by placing highly skilled IT professionals, either on a contract basis, a project basis, or even on a full-time basis. So if you're an employer looking for that perfect candidate, or you're that, a candidate looking for that perfect employer, go to roberthalf.com slash technologies. All right, so today I wanna welcome back Brian Corcoran, who was on our What Techies Really Want for Christmas episode back in December. Brian leads sales in the US for Search Unify, an AI powered cognitive search and chatbot platform. Now, he's a lifelong coach and teacher, and he works closely with companies to develop, deliver, and scale support experiences that make their customers smile. I love that. Brian is based out of Northern California. So Brian, I'm guessing you don't have the snow like we have over here on the East Coast and loves decompressing on weekends with sports, reading and producing music. Welcome back to the show, Brian. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be joining everybody. And uh, to your point, yeah, um, we're in the Bay Area. And I think the last time I saw snow was on a uh, 3000 foot high um, hill about a month ago. So that's about as close as we get. <laughs> All right, so today we're gonna talk about basically a career journey and Brian's story from going to from a retail uh, job uh, to a non-traditional like kind of in sales but now to a non-traditional sales career so Brian just tell the audience why did you change from retail to technical sales yeah I mean it's a definitely a million dollar question um, and I guess it kind of starts with the journey you know me going through college um, you know I was a political science major and by the you know I volunteered on a variety of campaigns and had you know taken a look at going to law school but by the time I graduated politics and law school were two of the options I decided I definitely did not want to do and and at that time I was you know like like anybody going through college you know you're focusing on your major but you might have a few additional dreams so for me I was uh, you know focused on becoming a music producer and was actually signed to Universal Records right around the time that I graduated but you know that certainly didn't pay the bills and I needed to take a look at you know kind of extending my business acumen and so you know this is right around the the height of the recession in um, you know 2000 early late 2007 early 2008 and um, you know, there weren't a lot of options. So I, I took a job, you know, as a retail manager, um, interesting, interestingly enough, working for Abercrombie and Fitch. And, um, you know, really, I, I was put in one of the stores that, you know, after finding out was uh, not one of the greatest locations in the company, but they put people in there that, you know, could hopefully, you know, make a difference and, and bring in some leadership skills. And, you know, there's a lot of headcount and turnover and, you know, Tom, when I, when I think back about it, it just seems clear as day, like a straight line to where I am now, but it definitely was, uh, you know, um, quite curved. And in the sense that I remember just sitting back one Christmas season, just saying to myself, you know, I've onboarded 50 new employees over the last three days, and I am absolutely tired of, of getting asked the same basic questions and having to tell them all the same answers. And it's been, it's expending my energy and I don't know how I'm going to get sleep. So with that being said, I started working on documenting and, and creating this culture of knowledge sharing. And, you know, our, our, our scores went up in terms of our secret shops. You know, we, we started seeing people's, you know, the smile on their face when they came in the store, you know, that smile was maintained when they left. And I, I got a sense that, you know, the more that you can put yourself in a position to be where your customer is with the knowledge to help them succeed, hey, there's something to this. And then I realized that, this is the same challenge that a lot of tech companies are doing and, you know, are going through. And that's when I realized that this concept of customer experience, knowledge management, you know, is being done at an enterprise scale. And, you know, I, I took a look at, you know, some of my friends that were in software and I decided, you know, I want to get into sales. This seems like where I've been, like I've got the right sort of people skill set. I understand a problem. Uh, and the problem was actually more enticing to me than, you know, commission and things like that. So I just felt that there was a good opportunity to get myself out of my store and figure out different ways that I could help, you know, different organizations that were going through similar challenges. So, yeah, that's, I would say, you know, and one of the, you know, left coaster is like 50 on boards in three days. I mean, and I guess like what you're like, to your point is like with, you know, people that work in like service centers and such, they get the same call over and over, but I, you know, and I, so you, you mentioned something about, you know, being signed with a, a record company. Is that what I heard? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So now that sounds really cool, but you said it didn't pay the bills. So look, I got to ask you, technical sales, does is it a rewarding career? I mean, pays the bills maybe. Oh yeah, I mean, it certainly pays the bills. Um, and, you know, 
it, looking back on it, Tom, it was one of the most one of the most worthwhile, fulfilling career choices I ever made. And it's it's because I decided that, you know, I wanted to create a better life for myself, for my family, set myself up, you know, with a with a better, better earning potential than I had within, you know, a store and working a salary. So the capability to, you know, kind of be responsible for your own destiny. I mean, in sales, you know, that that's certainly top of mind. Uh, what I think was like really the driver for me is, hey, I'm actually going out and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a perspective because I've gone through this as a practitioner. I understand like, you know, the, like the pitfalls and really like the, the, the moments of, of like that emotional high when you deliver an outstanding experience. And you're just thinking about, you know, like the organizations out there that, you know, multi-billion dollar organizations, they've got content all over the place. They're, you know, they're trying their best to connect with their customers. And then I realized, all of those, you know, physical experiences that I saw in the store, heck, Tom, these could even be people that are working for these organizations. And this is, you know, I'm seeing them go through a customer experience. And I realize, you know, there's not a lot of differences between what I see in the physical world and what's actually happening digitally. It's just that you needed an outside perspective, someone who had actually seen this, um, you know, in terms of what that emotional journey looks like, who could actually bring that perspective in. Because, you know, about you know, 10 years ago when I was really getting started on this is, you know, the, the practitioners that I was helping, they would say, well, yeah, I mean, our CSAT's good. We're seeing good efficiency, but you would find out that, you know, customers just like in my stores, if, if they're walking out and they had a frown on their face, are they going to tell you about it? No, like they're actually going to, uh, you know, voice their displeasure to others. So the more that I could actually figure out how can I catch people and figure out where were the disconnects at and then give that back to an organization and help them kind of figure out what those missed opportunities were. That's exactly what we're doing at, you know, in that retail store and we were rebuilding the store experience. The cool thing now is that Tom, we get to do that, you know, for like thousands of customers that, you know, that our clients are actually hoping to serve. So I think just the scale is super exciting. Um, being able to focus on helping, you know, customer, my customers solve real challenges and really getting an, under, an understanding. You have to know the jobs that they're doing, irrespective of all the flashy, the AI, the machine learning. Like it goes back to like really getting a sense of how is this person getting from point A to point B? Like what are the highs? What are the lows? And, and really, how do we help them? And I think like a lot of people think about sales being flashy and quick talking, but the same way that I help people find gene sizes, you know, there, there's still something, you know, in that discovery process that, you know, that comes into like an enterprise sales environment. And I think that if more people, you know, who would, who have gone through this retail path, you know, they should be looking at sales and really looking at some of the problems that they help people solve and seeing that there is a career for them that could be right in front of them, but they might just not know how to grasp it. I like your take on that too, because, you know, when I think of sales, I think like rejection, like I can't tell you how many emails every day I get from potential sales folks trying to, to get me to talk to them about buying something. So you're talking about solving problems and helping. That's really, really awesome. I think to your point, Tom, is, you know, how many people are reaching out and saying, hey, I want to talk to you about my company. Yeah. Like how many people are paying attention to you and understanding, hey, you get up in the morning, you're working from home right now in the time of COVID, you know, what are those special circumstances there you're working through? And then how is someone going to come in and say, you know, I respect what you do, Tom. I understand that there, you know, there's fellow practitioners that are, you know, going through similar challenges. And, you know, I'm not sure if this is even right for you, but if you're open to this conversation and this idea, then, you know, maybe that's something we could talk about. And I think that because everybody in sales, it, it can be crushing. But when I've been able to dis, kind of disassociate myself from the outcome and focus on I'm presenting, presenting an idea that can help someone do their job better, then you know, I don't have to worry so much about being liked. I will be liked because I'm understanding how, you know, how that value can be delivered for you know, a customer, an employee experience, or even a partner. And I think it's just really crucial to really, you know, before you think about yourself, like you have to know what, what you're, the people that you're trying to help are actually doing. Yeah. I was going to say, you said a key word there. I was going to mention like when, when I hear things like that from you as, you know, I don't think vendor, I think business partner and I, that makes the relationship so much better. So, yeah. Hey, uh, so we're coming, I got to ask you this question now you, you mentioned COVID. So what have you learned about technical sales and how's it changed uh, what you do during COVID? times like a pandemic where you can't go out and visit people all the time, or maybe, maybe sales are down. 
Mm -hmm. You know what? I've, I've never been busier. Um, and I think that there's a few things that go into that, Tom. I think one is, you know, a lot of the practitioners I've spoken with, they do really, really good at the tactical in terms of, you know, getting from point A to point B, especially what we saw even in the first couple months heading into COVID is we, I still felt like, you know, when we're talking to our practitioners, you know, there were considerations about COVID in, impacting the business, but, you know, their strategy was set and they were deploying and delivering that. What we found is when we got into the summer, well, where are they in this, their strategy? Those strategy meetings are not happening on site now, right? So there's there's actually another kind of gap that's forming that, you know, we were discovering the, the deeper that, that we went in those, these conversations. And I think what's what's been interesting for MySpace and, you know, with, with um, Search Unify, we help you know, customer support organizations connect their customers with content so you don't have to talk to a support agent as much, right? So the idea there is that what I'm really helping, um, you know, these organizations with is not even the search product that we sell, but really their people and process. Like, how are you listening to your customers? How are you creating knowledge as a byproduct of these interactions? And then when you lay the technology over it, because you've already focused on what they can control, um, which is right in front of them, that culture and the people that they're working with, then that enables the technology to help deliver better outcomes instead of just coming in and saying, hey, you know, best in breed AI machine learning um, tool in order to help you do more, right? That's just a digital statement. And honestly, we're all living digitally. Everybody can tell, you know, when those statements ring hollow. And I think that more so than anything in the time of COVID, you have to show that you care. And by showing that you understand someone's business and sh giving them that, that evidence that you've spent 15 minutes researching who they are and what they're trying to accomplish, I think that whether you're just getting started in sales or, you know, kind of questioning, you know, what is driving you every single day, it should be the challenges of your practitioners that you're trying to help solve. And if you've been in their shoes before, such as I have with, you know, being a support agent or working within a retail environment, you know, it makes it that much, that much more natural for you to have an organic conversation about challenges. I, I, I almost never mentioned my product name. And I think the reason why is that, you know, it will naturally kind of lead in that direction if we're being honest and acting with integrity. So the last thing I got to ask you, though, is you meant you talked about like, you know, working, you know, kind of knowing the stuff. Uh, is this a career for somebody that's just getting out of college or, or high school or something? Like that? And if so, how would they what would they do to get into this? Oh, I go out. I go after all of my friends, all of my relatives who are, you know, um, like non-engineering majors, you know, and I'm asking them, you know, what are you thinking about in terms of, you know, the the direction that you want to head, po you know, post college or post high school? And, you know, Tom, there's there's basically only like 30 universities in the U.S. that have an accredited major for sales. So almost everybody that you talk to. They'll say, hey, I fell into sales. I kind of fell into it accidentally. I think a lot of us may may actually fall into it accidentally or we have an idea of why we want to be in sales. But what keeps you there is that growth mindset. I mean, every single thing that I feel that I've really learned about sales and customer experience and how to orchestrate the two together naturally, it comes from after you know graduating college. So there's this quote from John Wooden that I think I'll kind of you know help wrap us up on this is that it's what you learn after you know it all that counts the most. And so there's been like 55 different sales books. I mean, the, my first job in tech, uh, and I'll give him a shout out because he's a dear friend, Brandon, uh, you know, he gave me one, gave me a recommendation on one of the first sales books that I read. And Tom, even, you know, eight months ago, I went back and reread it and retook notes on the entire thing. So you'll never, you'll never, um, you'll, you'll never be doing yourself a disservice if you're always looking in that direction of growth and just challenge yourself because if you can grow your comfort zone, I'm finding it very, very comforting that, you know, I get into conversations where I'm not on the back foot because I'm understanding, I'm listening. I'm not focused on what I'm going to say next. That's, you can, you yeah. can just, sell, you can just, you can just sell out specifically for the customer. And I think if we can all do that a little bit more and focus on listening and, and understanding that everybody's got a battle out there, how can you help them? Or if you can't help them, how can you, you know, provide perspective that would be helpful for them? I think that's the takeaway that I've learned that's that's really helped me feel a lot better in terms of when I do get rejected. And again, now it's the rejecting the idea. Maybe it's not the right time. They're not rejecting the person. Not you or that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I do have to say that's 
it's that time for the show to, to get, wrap up. But Brian, once again, it was great spending time with you and especially talking about something that I love talking about. One of my favorite topics is career journeys and how people get to where they are, uh, you know. So thank you for taking time to chat with us and, uh, you know, really want to thank you a lot. Uh, for the audience out there, I want you to, to join us next week because we talk with HDI legend Roy Atkinson about connecting in a disconnected world. So remember to set your calendar for next Wednesday uh, and also subscribe to our Twitch and our YouTube channel so that you can watch all of our episodes. So we'll see you next week. Hashtag HDI local.